From the dawn of 2008 we came, toiling silently down through the potosphere, reading many different tales, voicing several different parts, struggling to reach the milestone of 100 episodes, when the hosts who remain will prattle to the last. Only a few listeners have known we were among you. Until now. Here we are, born to be kings. We're the princes of the universe. If you say so. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. And now, pendejo, let's see what sort of podcast you've become. Woof. Here, here. <laughs> Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. And this is episode 100. 100. Can you believe it? That's such a big question. I probably shouldn't <laughs> answer it. Yes. No, of course I can't believe it. Today we've got, he's got to be our most run author, Rick Kennett, right? He might be. He's, uh, he's getting up there for sure. I think this is maybe the fifth time that we've had him on the show. And uh, the reason we have this story at all is the other day, or not the other day, a while back, many episodes ago, we were talking about what would it be that you would like to hear on the show? If you could have any wish, like what would you like more, to see? I'd like to see more fairy stories about the police. <laughs> yeah, and if I could have any wish, I wished for some space opera. And uh, Rick said, I heard you asking for space opera. I think I got the story for you. And he dropped it in and... He sure did. This was the story for me. I really like this story. And so, um, what's today's story, Big? This story is called The Battle of Layla the Dog. And now, a word about the author Rick is a repeat offender. I mean, contributor to the Dune Steve. Uh, there's not much we can say by way of introduction that he hasn't said already for us. So, his name is still Rick. He still lives in Melbourne, and he still works in the transport industry as possibly the longest-serving motorcycle courier in the world, if not the galaxy. At the recent World Science Fiction Convention, AussieCon 4, he was pointed out as one of Australian horror's best-kept secrets, which may or may not be something to rejoice over. The Battle of Layla the Dog was first published in... Idolon number five in 1991. The Battle of Layla the Dog by Rick Kennett. She took notice of it the second time, in a spare moment after successfully tilting her donuts. She half turned in her seat and listened, to the whisper of the air recyclers, to the occasional voice, to the low hum of the drive being tested. Something had grunted, there at her feet, a sort of animal grunt, soft. She was sure she hadn't imagined it, not the second time. But all seemed normal in the control room. Activity was building up again after five days in subspace. Visual screens were still blank, but data lights were winking on the engineering, navigation, and fire control boards. She looked up at Captain Brown, in the command position. His eyes were on his data screen and scanner repeaters. He seemed not to have heard anything, nor had any of the other officers and technicians. For a moment, she wondered if she were going senile at 17. She hoped not. It was emergence day today and she'd have to be sparky when Utopia Plane hit the battlefields of the Procyon system in a few hours. She peered at the space under her chair, as if daring it to grunt again. The captain's voice came quietly from her earphones. Lieutenant de Gurch, report maneuvering status, please. De Gurch tongued her lip mic. 
Gravity donuts tilting correctly through their arcs, sir. Lieutenant Peters will take over the rest of the pre-emerge checks. Christ Plane is reported having engaged in an enemy vessel in the vicinity of Procyon 3. Alter our final emergence coordinates accordingly. Aye, aye, sir. She replied, but slotted her seat over to navigation with some misgivings. She knew the coalition forces consolidating on Procyon 3 were a prime target for enemy attention, a target requiring the heavy firepower attacks of a big ship. Degurch began computing a new exit hole in space, all too aware that Utopia Plane was not a big ship, and that even in company with Christ Plane, the odds might not greatly improve. And that was assuming just one enemy vessel. Something behind her gave a low whine. She spun about and stared down at the space behind her chair, where absolutely nothing could be seen. What the hell was that? Her oddly pitched voice sounded harsh in the control room quiet. All heads turned her way, but no one answered. She realized then that no one else had heard it. Something wrong, Lieutenant DeGurch? asked Brown. I thought I heard a gravity generator anomaly, sir, she said, not quite believing it. Whether or not Brown did, he said, Run checks on the grav gens and compensators, Lieutenant Peters. I'm not taking this ship into battle if the first 50G maneuver she does turns us all into red jelly. As Peters went to work, DeGurch knew he was wasting his time. There was nothing wrong with the grav gens. That wine had been animal. And personal. Utopia Plane emerged from subspace at the edge of the Procyon system, her crew at battle stations, watching and listening, finding nothing. Inwardly rotating donuts of intensely focused gravity rippled down her hull. The donuts tilted, and the ship curved toward the bright pinpoint of Procyon. Vanishing, she reappeared a second later millions of kilometers further in, where the frozen gas giants rolled. Again and again she skipped in and out of dimension, never in one place long enough to present a target. Now cruising an asteroid belt, now passing the rocky middle worlds, now arrowing through the shadows of the warm inner planets, each time closing with the white disk of Procyon. Saida Gurch had been too preoccupied to take pride in the precision of the ship's final exit from subspace. Although more important matters had crowded that weird whining to the back of her mind, it continued to push into her consciousness. It had sounded so pitiful, so directed at her. And the more she thought of it, the more she wondered about that earlier grunting. Contact barrier, 330 by 20, said the electric voice from the scanner room. Range, 95,000 and closing. Engage, 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 said the captain. DeGurch cursed her inattentiveness. There it was on her fire control screen. A shadow, a shape, an image, the target. Crosshairs centered, numbers flickered across her screen. Ranges, bearings, speeds. Forward lasers, fire. Nothing happened. For a second, she knew cold panic, then realized the identification light was on, locking out the fire control system. She gritted her teeth. It had been one of the captain's impromptu drills. The target had been their sister ship, Christ Plane. Stand to, said Brown. Prepare to come about. As DeGurch expected, the captain's next words came through her phones. Sloppy, sigh, Very sloppy. You've done far better than this in drills, and here it could have been the real thing. She glanced up. Yes, he was watching her. I was thinking about that wine. I can't seem to set it out of my mind. Grav Jen running out of line. It's happened before. You know Lieutenant Peters found no such thing, Ralph. Then what do you think it was? It sounded like a dog. Perhaps, I. But what do you think it was? She said nothing, but only looked up at him again. And again, there were no answers. Engage! 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 said the captain. Sparky now, not caught unawares this time. DeGurch had Utopia Plane's initial laser pulses off before Christ Plane did, hitting the enemy vessel they'd intercepted forward and amidships. It was a small ship, almost too small to be a concern for the planetary forces on Procyon 3. It was accelerating now, opening the range, gravity rings rippling down its hull. On DeGurch's weapons screen, the image distorted like plastic. Hard to keep in the sights. Laser pulses from Christ Plane, seen as streaks of white light flashed past it. She's playing hard to get, said DeGurch with a mad gleam in her eye, and the pitch of the drive's hum climbed. 
fire forward and starboard lasers. The ship echoed with the howls of the pulse lasers, but the enemy seemed to twist again, and only two shots found the target. Utopia planes grabbed Jen's whined and non-animal sound as she accelerated through a 100-degree turn. The enemy came back into the crosshairs. Range still opening, said DeGurch. Close the range, said Brown. Accelerating, Utopia plane moved in, firing. A million kilometers away, Christ plane closed from the opposite direction, firing. DeGurch's screen lit with thin white lines raining towards the enemy. Then those lines twisted, bent themselves into sharp canine ears, the stars becoming eyes and teeth, the hole bulging from the screen like an animal snout. And DeGurch, in her orgasm of battle frenzy, did not, could not, see the dog's head pushing out at her until it howled like the lasers howling through the ship. She shouted, shoving at the thing, touching nothing, pushing against her seatbelt, pushing backwards from the console. The guns fell silent. And in that moment of defenselessness, the enemy closed at 200 G acceleration, firing. Utopia plane shuddered, and from somewhere aft, dull thunder rolled, drowning out the incoherent yells of the girl thrashing in her seat. Captain Brown reread Damage Control's report accompanied by pictures of buckled superstructure shot by hull-crawling inspection cameras. He compared them with Dr. Norsk's casualty report of two superficial injuries and a first-degree radiation burn. Damn lucky. Norsk had scrawled near the bottom. The captain agreed, but it shouldn't have happened in the first place. Nowhere in the report could he find an explanation for DeGurch's behavior. The only thing pertaining to that was the comment, almost an afterthought, Lieutenant DeGurch, under observation. He glanced down at Lieutenant Peters, now stationed at fire control. He was a good officer, sharp, thoroughgoing, and the ship's next best weapons officer. The only thing he lacked was de Gerch's genetically engineered empathy with the ship's fighting machinery. On the main screen, there was nothing but stars. The enemy had escaped, forcing Utopia Plane and Christ Plane to diverge into separate search patterns. For the moment, all was quiet. But he always felt more secure with Tegurch at fire control. Losing her in that position was like losing a piece of equipment. What the hell was the matter with her? He opened a line to the infirmary and asked, I can find nothing wrong with her, Ralph, Dr. Norsk told him. Physically or mentally. Then why does she say a dog jumped out of her weapons screen, Ben? There was a long silence in which Brown could almost hear the doctor shrug. Look, Ralph, Norsk said at last. She's a first-generation product of the Gartino experiment. And after nearly 20 years, we still don't know their full potential. Gartinos are still showing new developments, and not all of those developments are for the best. Are you saying that because of a genetic origins, my second-in-command could go psycho at any moment? No, Norsk replied with some impatience. But there have been quirks and, and lapses before with Gartinos. I'd like to keep her under observation for a while longer. Then you're classifying her as unfit for duty? Yes. Ben, she's crucial to the firepower of this ship. That was little more than a scouter we fought. I wouldn't mind betting there's something bigger out there somewhere. If that's the way you feel, Ralph, then you can have her back. But first ask yourself if you can trust her not to see dogs again at a critical moment. Saida Gertz sat on the edge of a bed in Utopia Plains Infirmary, feeling not so much under observation as like a naughty girl confined to her room. She said, Am I cracking up, Doctor? Do you think you are? He asked. She hesitated, remembering the original grunting and what she'd thought at the time. I'm not sure. She smiled briefly. Isn't that a good sign? Doesn't madness always deny itself? You're not mad, Mr. Gertz. Then what? The mind is still largely unmapped territory. We know more about what's out there. He swept his arm around to indicate the universe. Then what's in here? He tapped his head. Your being a Gartino may also be a factor. The effects of stress on someone such as yourself are still unknown. I mean, here you are, the executive officer of a fighting ship, when most people your age are fighting acne. 
that must have some effect in terms of stress. But the question is, how does it manifest itself? By hearing animal noises, Doctor? By seeing dogs leap out of fire control screens? What do dogs mean to you? Nothing. I was born on Phobos. And although it's the larger moon of Mars, it's still a very small place as inhabited worlds go. So I grew up in fairly cramped quarters. No room for a dog. Hardly room for a normal upbringing. If I can use the word normal at all. Perhaps dogs represent normality to you. Subconsciously, I mean. Normality? She slipped from the bed, paced a few steps, and stopped. Just before leaving the solar system, when we did that quick trip to Earth to replace and recalibrate our sensors in orbit, I had my first good look at the home world. Can't say I was particularly impressed. Although my family came from there generations ago, I feel no affinity with the planet. There's nothing of me there now. I'm a Martian, and normality to me is a small red world with planet-wide dust storms, surface temperatures usually little better than freezing, and an atmosphere that's still being built. I can't see how dogs fit into that picture. Then why do you think you saw a dog jump out at you from the weapons screen? She sat down again and looked up at him. Once more, there were no answers. Engage! 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 Captain Brown could see that it wasn't the same ship they'd fought five hours before. Though it was still at extreme range, it was obviously the big ship he'd been hoping not to find. At least, not alone. He opened a line to communications. Give Kreuz plane our tactical position and celestial fix. He looked again at the screen. Yes, it was a very big ship. Tell them to get the hell over here at maximum acceleration. She'll need at least 20 minutes, he thought. Down at fire control, Lieutenant Peters had the target nailed in the sights. Starboard lasers, fire! The image disappeared amid a smother of white streaks, then re-emerged, swinging left, swinging right, firing, closing, curving, dodging, firing, closing, distorting on the screens, impossible to follow, accelerating, closing, firing. 20 degrees starboard, said Brown. Forward lasers, fire, said Peters. In it came, hit and hit and hit, but still closing, still firing, large in the sights. Peters yelled and instinctively covered his face. Utopia plane shook, hit, once, twice, smashed amidships, smashed aft. Out of the rolling thunder came the whine of gravgens and the howl of pulse lasers following the enemy as it slammed past. Brown watched the report scroll up on his damage control screen, then forgot it entirely. Behind all this chaos, he could hear the barking of a dog. She floated, cramped in darkness, knowing only fear and loneliness. She'd been there a long time, shut away a long time, in the close dark a long time, round and round and round. She padded metal floors, free and not free, really in that little dark ball, but now padding metal floors, free, almost free, like she had been in the sunlight. And she saw herself, not herself, asleep. And she sat brushing the floor behind in an arc so happy, nearly rest at last, soft crying, waiting no more, leaping like she used to in the sunlight. <gasps> DeGurch started awake with the action alarm. She sat up on the bed, feeling confused, training telling her to move, orders telling her to stay, while her mind tried to catch some elusive dream, fading, gone. The alarm stopped. And in that little bit of silence before the lasers began to howl, she heard that animal sound, that whining again, soft and plaintive. There with her on the bed, there in front of her, there where something was trying to form out of a milky cloud of no particular shape. She leaned forward, staring. Who are you? As if in answer, her dream returned, vivid to her mind. When the action alarm rang, Dr. Norsk was at his battle station in the surgery, taking inventory for the nth time with his two assistant paramedics. By the time they'd masked and had started scrubbing up, 
the howl of the lasers had begun. Dr. Norsk, sir. Norsk looked up from the basin. Lieutenant DeGurch stood in the doorway. This is now a sterile area, he said above the pulse howls. Return to the infirmary, please. Either that or join the first aid party if you feel you can... I understand the dog now. You understand the... He gave his assistants a warning look, then checked DeGurch's telemetry readings on a bank of nearby meters. Blood pressure and heart rate were up, nothing more than battle tension normal, but brain activity was running riot. It's probably better you return to the infirmary and rest. I don't think you're at all fit for duty yet. I'm not cracking up, Dr. Norsk, she said. And I can prove it now. Ask the captain to get a hull crawler out to number one ion exhaust on our port quarter. There's a large spherical object lodged there. It collided with us and got stuck there while our sensors were down when we were in Earth orbit. That's where she is. Norsk gave her a long, searching look and wondered if the nerve of this experimental girl had finally broken. He made to speak, but was interrupted by the whine of the grav gins, unusually violent. Utopia Plane was maneuvering for her life. How do you know of this spherical object? He asked, using his best bedside manner. The dog showed me. She shook her head in frustration, then slowly said, I saw it up here. She tapped her forehead. After nearly 20 years, we still don't know their full potential. He remembered saying that not five hours before. Oh, doctor, please, let me go back. Whether it was the urgency of her tone, the pleading in her eyes, or some idea that she was indeed telling the truth, he suddenly heard himself saying, Return to duty. Thank you. (laughs) She laughed and spun about. And in that brief moment, Norsk saw in her the little girl she had never been. Then she was gone. And with her, he could have sworn he saw the blur scampering at her heels. Range, 800,000 and opening. Target coming about to port. The captain barely heard the voice from the scanner room, barely comprehended the report on his damage control screen. He listened again for the dog, but it was gone. On his repeater screen, the enemy ship was curving through a million-kilometer arc, its tilted gravity rings distorting starlight into flares and patterns. Brown looked again at the damage control readout. Damage to maneuvering, to engineering, to hull frames which didn't look like standing another attack. He checked his repeater, then glanced in Lieutenant Peter's direction, wondering. As he opened a line to the torpedo flat, he noticed the flashing call light on surgery's line. He gave orders to his torpedo people first, then answered the doctor. By that time, the enemy was closing again. Hunched over the weapon screen, Peters noted with apprehension the winking of the torpedo-ready lights. They were the weapons the underdog used when things looked desperate. Then suddenly, there was no more time for worry or doubt. Target range, 900,000, said the scanner room. Closing at 100G, 120, 140. Range now 800,000 and closing. Permission to relieve you, Mr. Peters. He jerked about and stared with open-faced surprise at Lieutenant de Gurch, standing beside him. He glanced up at the captain, who simply nodded and pointed to the torpedo control panel. 750,000 in closing. Peters quickly unbuckled his seatbelt and vacated the chair, trying not to show his confusion and utter relief. 700,000 in closing. De Gurch adjusted her headset. Stand by aft tubes, Lieutenant Peters. Half speed, widespread, fire. Forward tubes, full speed, medium cluster, fire. Soundless seconds later, eight spreading lines etched across her screen, intersected the following moment by eight more diverging from the opposite direction. Target taking evasive action. Peters glanced at DeGurch. She didn't seem to be listening to the scanner room at all, and her breathing came shallow and rapid in his earphones. Brown, watching his weapons repeater, saw the crosshairs leave the target, go hunting across the screen. Frowning, he leaned forward, cold with doubt. Range 600,000 and closing. Stand by, starboard lasers, said to Gurch, distant and choppy. What the hell is she doing? Brown thought. She didn't seem to be watching her screen at all, but simply staring straight ahead. He opened a line to her, heard her panting. Be patient, little one. Be patient. He switched off, suddenly scared. The enemy began to fire. On the screen, the crosshairs veered to a point ahead of the target. DeGurch said, Detonate first salvo. Then, Starboard lasers, fire. 
Target hit by torpedo! Said the scanner room. The lasers howled. An instant before the target disappeared inside a smother of detonations, Brown saw it shoved into the crosshairs by the torpedo hit. Then all was chaos, and the howl of the lasers going and going, and DeGurch yelled once as the target area swelled and swelled, a glowing circle engulfing half the screen, then fading, thinning, gone, leaving nothing. She slumped in her seat, head lulled back, wet with sweat, breathing slowing again, consciousness coming back to her staring eyes. Brown stared down at her from the command position, shocked with the realization of how literally true it was that he'd thought of her as a piece of fire control equipment, an integral part of the ship's capacity for destruction. Over the next four days, Utopia Plane, in company with Christ Plane, decelerated gingerly at 30G, while hull crawlers made patchwork repairs to the damage. During these operations, engineers, led by Lieutenant de Gerch, found a large metallic sphere lodged in an ion exhaust on the port quarter. Brought on board, it proved to be an ancient satellite, which had apparently collided with the ship while in Earth orbit. They cut an opening but it was Cy de Gerch who insisted she alone should crawl in to remove what she knew to be there. It was a somber trio, Cy, Captain Brown, and Dr. Norsk, who gathered around the hole dug deep into the soil of the windy grassland. The sky was blue and peacefully empty. The planet was now secure, and the fighting was gradually moving away from Procyon Three. Out of a sense of occasion, all three wore their formal uniforms. Sai lowered the little bundle of mummified remains into the hole. Goodbye, Layla. It's not Earth exactly, but it's rest at last. She stepped back to allow the captain and the doctor to fill in the grave. By identifying the satellite and tracing it through historical records, it was found to have been launched at the dawn of the space age, carrying a dog named Layla into orbit. But in those early days... There'd been no way home, and Layla, after a week of orbiting, had died. Thirst? Suffocation? Loneliness? It wasn't clear. With the burial complete, the three stood looking at each other, feeling awkward. Far above, Utopia Plane was orbiting, being readied to join a concerted thrust into enemy space. The men turned and made their way back to the shuttlecraft, but Sai stayed a moment to place a flower on the little grave. She felt the heat of the day, smelt the green of the grass, and listened to the wind, listened with a kind of envy as it carried away the distant, happy barking of a dog. Author's Note As with Ernie Pine, the reluctant ghost hunter... So, Cyda Gurch and the crew of the Utopia Plane are recurring characters in my stories. Cy originally appeared in a space opera novel I self-published in 1982, which failed to hit the bestseller list, a common fate of self-publishing. Some years later, I spruced up the characters and threw them into a series of science fiction stories, some with supernatural themes, the first of which was The Battle of Layla the Dog. Although the story is based on Laika the Russian dog aboard Sputnik 2, Layla is not Laika. Sputnik 2 fell out of orbit and burned up in the atmosphere in April of 1958, Laika herself having died some months before, only hours into the flight. Layla is a completely different other space dog in a completely different other space capsule. In my matter moments, and I have a few, I think of writing a chronologically connected series of stories about Psy, from lowly space cadet to Lady High Admiral of the Galaxy, such as C.S. Forrester did with his Hornblower series set in the early 19th century. But this is something I know I'll never do, despite having written two stories detailing Psy's younger space schooling days and another due out in Arialis in 2011, where she is 18 and obtained the rank of acting captain. And like Ernie Pine, reluctantly hunting ghosts, Cyda Gurch is also a creature of contradiction, a test to being embracing her gung-ho mindset while bitterly resenting her creation as a piece of biological ordinance. After the story, the cast list. 
Side of Gurch was played by R. E. Chambliss, Scanner Room guy. Oh, we never got his name, but I'm sure he's a very important character. Was played by Rich Girardi, and Lieutenant Peters was played by Josh Roseman. The captain was played by Rich Outfield, who was also our narrator. And Dr. Norsk was played by Big Anglovich. So that was our offering for you for this 100th episode. I hope you enjoyed it. We kind of handpicked this story for the 100th episode just because we both really liked it a lot, I think. Um, we've spoken before on this show about the me, you and I are dog people. Not dog people like... When the full moon arises, <laughs> a startling metamorphosis occurs. No, we are, uh, we, we are people who like dogs as opposed to people who like cats more. Um, I think we've even spoken before about the outer space dog Laika. Just how touching the whole story of that dog is and how sad it makes you feel that this dog was sent up into space in this capsule and, you know, just left for dead. There's this song that Jonathan Colton did. He, had, he was in a songwriting contest. I think it's called Song Foo or something like that. And uh, he had to write songs and they gave him topics. And the topic or whatever, they, they said to do a homage song for Space Oddity. Of course, the first thing that came to mind for him was he's going to do the song about the first monkey that went into space because he's done uh, hundreds of songs about, about monkeys, monkeys, it seems. But he said, no, that's just being a parody of myself here. I've, I've got to try and do something different. And so instead, he decided to do the first dog that went to space. And he researched into the story of Laika and he wrote this really touching song about a dog going to space. I think uh, the first time that you heard it, you went and looked up Laika on Wikipedia and you read about it and then you listened to the song and you were just bawling over what, this song. What got me was there was a photograph of the memorial to Laika and it shows this little dog perking up his ears and I don't know, it just floored <laughs> me and... I, I have no connection. I wasn't alive during the space race mm -hmm. and all that. But I just, oh, it spoke to me in some impossible to express way. And when I first read this story, my niece was over. And I, I was babysitting her. And I have no idea why I, I did it. But I thought it would be fun to read the story aloud to her. And uh, I, I didn't make it to the end. <laughs> I, it just... It really, really moved me. And I didn't know where it was going, uh -huh. except for that other people had liked it or, or you had liked it and uh -huh. said, read this story. You'll dig it. And, uh, you know, I'm sure she's like, wow, you are such a pussy. But <laughs> that's what she says. Uncle Rish, why are you such a pussy? <laughs> it's a long story, honey. Sit down. Many years ago. I hate you, Uncle Rish. No, you don't. It just it, it really moved me. And, and as you said, we are dog people. When the full moon strikes. Right. right. Because that has gotten us in trouble before. I mean, because cat people are such <laughs> <laughs> We won't say whether dogs are, are better than cats or anything in this episode. We'll just... You make your own decision. Except to say that if the ghost on the ship were that of a cat, they all would have perished. <laughs> Big... That Space Doggity song is Creative Commons, right? It is, yes. The plan is to play it. Let, let's play it right now. Okay, we will play the song right now. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. It's touching. The cage is very small A tiny silver ball Makes you a hero The moment you step inside The world is watching you you're about to do will live on forever, even though you'll be dead and gone. But the love we're about to turn. Sputnik 
the song it really touches me for some reason it makes me think as as we were listening to it i was thinking of you know a couple weeks ago we spoke at length about whiffets Um, dogs are almost like a simpler version of whiffets uh if you didn't listen to the show there were these aliens in the tobias bakel story that they simple-mindedly they just wanted to learn and pass on that learning, and, and that was kind of how they reproduced, was by passing on learning t- to their children. But they were just really eager. They just wanted to be there with these humans that had landed on their world, and they wanted to serve them and to learn, and it made them so happy just to be able to be with these people. And dogs are so very much like that. I guess they're pack animals, so they want to be with other animals. So, you know, they're, they're really loyal to uh, their masters. The other day I was at work, I worked in television, and we were going to have a dog on the air, I believe it was some kind of uh, adopt this dog segment that we were doing, and I'm walking through the uh, office and then all of a sudden there's this dog right there, and it wasn't what I was expecting, because you know, we don't often, people don't often have dogs at work, oh, and so I petted it for a minute and this dog, it made me feel so bad. <laughs> Made me want to adopt the poor dog right there because, you know, the dog comes over and I pet it a little bit and scratch his ears. And and as I tried to let go, then it hopped up. It jumped up and, you know, just wanted to be loved a little bit more. Dogs are so very much like that. They just, they they want to be with people. They want to be loved and to give love. And uh, the song and the, the story as well, you know, they basically run right together, these two pieces of art that we've shared with you on on our show today they they kind of run parallel with each other in that they have this dog that it was taken from its natural place its natural world but it wants to serve it just wants to be what its human masters want it to be and so it went on this space capsule and you know the poor thing must have been freaking out when it was launched into friggin space and they say that it died probably within a couple hours of orbit 
But yeah, the feelings expressed by Jonathan Colton for this dog and his song are just how, uh, well, here I am. You've launched me into space. Thanks for the dog food. Uh, I don't know if I want to be a good dog here anymore because as the people did in that Tobias Bakel story where they took advantage of the Whiffets in every way they could, people sometimes are that way. And it makes me feel kind of bad sometimes just to think about, you know, the, the way that sometimes we're not so good to the dogs that we call good dogs, you know. We'll, I don't know. I mean, what was the purpose of launching a live dog into space, do you think? Well, obviously it would be preparatory to sending a human being up there. Right. And they went dog, then chimp, uh -huh. and then person, then cosmonaut. <laughs> um, but That came after the person, right? <laughs> I, I suppose that they were monitoring its, its, its vital, vital signs and all whatnot. that, but there's sort of a question of what killed Lyco, whether it was freezing to death, whether it was shock, whether it was cosmic rays. So I don't know how that works. Hmm. But, so, But certainly, okay, once it gets down... You would think, yeah. It's, we would know definitively if they had done an autopsy, right? I think it didn't just come right back down, did it? I mean, it came down eventually in, in a, a, a little while. It said 1958, was it, that it burned up and came down? Oh, it's so Sputnik 2 burned up. So there would have been no autopsy. Yeah, maybe that was the problem, is that there wasn't anything left when it came down. But you know, there's, there's, there's a science fiction story, and if I were better read, I could tell you what it was, but there's a science fiction story where aliens are observing Earth when we send up Sputnik and Sputnik 2, and they rescue Laika before he perishes. And we never know it. We just assume that he's dead. Again, if you had a better co-host, I guess he, he would know <laughs> the name of that story. Yeah, in the, the comments, comments, they'll mention it. Something about the the loyalty of a dog, the the eagerness to please, the the, the Whiffet story, which really also moved me, and and it seems like the audience responded to it. I think it's one of our best episodes. Uh -huh. That that need for approval in a dog is, in my opinion, their most endearing quality. And I know that cat people see that as a negative for dogs and and again no judgment it's just i i love that i love that the dog wants to hear good boy and wants to right. to be appreciated and i certainly understand that putting out this podcast week after week we want people to say that it's good we want people to appreciate the work that went into it whether it was brian lincoln producing or, or you you edited this episode yeah since it's been a hundred episodes um you know, I, I want to thank the listeners who have done that, who have told us that the show is important to them, who have told us that they were moved or scared, freaked out, amused, <laughs> interested. And can I ask you to do me a favor, if you're a listener? It's been 100 episodes, but if you've if you got somebody that you think might appreciate the show, let them know. Blog about it. Mention it in Facebook. You know, just, just share it with somebody else because... We like that dog, and, <laughs> and we right. want to hear that we're good boys. We want to hear good boy, yeah. I was actually thinking about talking about this a little bit. I was looking at our stats the other day, and we are like within sniffing distance of having 2,000 listeners. We've come really close to that point, and I would, I'd love to be able to push it above that, push it to the next level, you know. And I was thinking, how could we do that? Like you were saying, you blog about the show. If you ha have people that read your blog, then they can see what you have to say about it and maybe they'll come check it out. Or tweet about the show or retweet the tweets that we put out about the uh, episode uh, hitting. You know, say, hey, this is good. Check it out or something like that and retweet that along. The vast majority of our listeners come from iTunes. So go on there if you've got a minute. And give us a review or just give us some stars or uh, a third thing that you know about because you're on iTunes and I don't know about because I'm not. <laughs> yeah. Or post a thing about us on Facebook. Say, oh, yeah, I listen to the Dune Steve because they're cool or whatever. There's lots of different ways in today's day and age. Or, you know, tell your friends. You have friends that probably share similar interests with you. So they'd probably think that Dune Steve was cool, too, if you think it's cool. Mention it to them. Let them know. Spread the word. I actually went through and I made up a little flyer. I thought, heck, I could just print out like 
25 of these and I, I made it so that there's four flyers per page so then you would have a hundred and then just like i don't know next time you're at the bookstore you could just take one of those uh, or five or ten of them out of your uh your car and stick them under the windshield wipers of the cars around you as you go into the uh, store or something i'll put that on the uh, show notes for this episode so you guys could if you are so inclined do the same thing just have a bunch of flyers for the show when you go into the bookstore or the library it seems like obvious places to do it but you could do it anywhere at the supermarket or wherever the heck it is that you happen to be driving with i've got a stack of a hundred of them in my uh glove box and i'm just gonna start sticking them on people's cars whenever i go uh, somewhere like that because that's another way too that i bet a lot of the people that get something like that will not even realize that it's available I mean, one thing about getting her name out on other podcasts is you can get people that didn't know that your podcast exists to listen to your podcast but there's a lot of people that don't know what podcasts are and you know not only will we expand our listeners but we'll expand the podosphere <laughs> here we are heck we've got a hundred episodes worth for them to uh go back through and listen to all those uh, stories yeah <laughs> <laughs> we recorded a couple months ago a, a final episode of the show just to have so that we wouldn't fade off into the night with no one knowing how we feel. So it's, it's something that I had thought about for a long time of shows. I, I guess Firefly is the one I'm thinking of. You know, it's like if, if a show knew that it wouldn't last or, you know, it was going to be canceled – if they just had a final episode set aside, how great that would be that they could say, okay, well, I guess we'll run the final episode. Yeah, and that would be cool. Although so, they'd probably cancel it and not allow you to air that. Right. If it were Fox, <laughs> they would be like, oh, F you. And it's weird how often Fox's whole credo seems to be, oh, F you. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. That is. The reason I, I brought it up is in that episode, we sort of tried to spend all of our thanks, mention everybody we could think of and, and say goodbye to everybody. And here's our anniversary show or 100th episode, episode, whatever you call it. You know, I'm tempted to do the same sort of thing and thank people and mention people that, that never get appreciated. But no, let's, let's just treat this as a regular episode. Talk more about dogs and daughters. Discuss amongst yourselves. It is a milestone to reach 100 episodes, and I don't know how many podcasts do. I mean, there are certain podcasts out there that just come out every Thursday or every Monday or, or whatever it is, and they rack up 100 episodes very quickly. Never look back. But we haven't been able to do that. It's been difficult. And now that we have producers that are helping us out, that are volunteering to take a story off our hands and do all the work that it takes to get it done... Well, we're, we're having episodes come much more often, but like this episode, I'm, I'm fairly sure is, is late. A day or two, perhaps. And that's just two, because perhaps. of me. I've been sick this week and we left it till the very end. A lot of these episodes will record, you know, two months before they air. Right. And this one, because we wanted it to be up to date, we just postponed it until let's, let's record it right before it airs. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know how long it will be until you hear that final episode. It's difficult to say. The same thing that we said in that episode is we don't know why that final episode is airing. You know, maybe it's a good reason. Maybe it's a bad reason. Maybe it's just life, or, you know, mm -hmm. something banal that everybody experiences. And I don't know if we'll get to 200 like Travelcast did, but it has been really cool to do all these stories and do all these fun voices and all these conversations afterward. And I, I hope that our listeners, the, the ones that, that look forward to us week after week, feel like we're friends, like they're catching up with an old buddy that they haven't seen for a long time, or are just amused by you and I being friends, or just you know listening through the wall at what their neighbors are talking about. <laughs> what do you hope people get from the show? I hope that the stories that they hear are f number one that they enjoy the stories the stories are fun that the, when they're done they're like oh boy i'm glad i listened to that instead of going gosh where's that 45 minutes i wish i could have it back because my death is that much closer and i'm no better off and i i hope that sometimes there are stories that touch them and move them stories that scare them like you i i hope they 
enjoy listening to us talk afterwards, that they have fun, that they feel like they're listening to their friends hang out instead of some guys that they don't know that are in somebody's kitchen hundreds of miles away talking to themselves kind of a thing. Basically, we're here as entertainment when it comes down to it. And I hope people are entertained. I hope that they like the stories that we have to tell and the goofy things that we have to say afterwards. It's really all I want is for people to have a good time with it. So back to Layla, the dog. We said before that we are dog people and that we really enjoy the companionship that dogs offer. And I was sort of getting to this before I ever we kind of sidetracked. Did I interrupt you? But, like uh, I am right now. Right. The idea of this dog, Layla, who was an early pioneer in space, sent up into space and left there. And now here we have her ghost, who's longing for nothing else but to be able to get back down to the earth, to be a part of nature. In this case, she never makes it back to earth, but to be on the ground again to, and to feel the ground, you know, you I, it's just something that really kind of speaks to me. I think that's probably what a lot of ghost stories, and this in this case, it's a ghost story, but it's not a scary ghost story. It's more of a touching, happy kind of a ghost story. Stories like that tend to usually be something like that. It's a ghost that just wants to be back home or wants to watch over you or something like that. I've had several ideas actually for ghost stories that are similar to that. I wrote a story actually uh, last year when, was it last year? Must have been two years ago now, geez. <laughs> when I was in Canada that time two years ago where uh, I had nothing to do whatsoever. And so I figured, heck, I'm going to write a whole bunch of stuff. And I wrote the story about a guy who uh, was stuck and he just wanted to be with his friend that he had a job with that he worked with at the time. And that was the reason why he was still around it's it's kind of a touching thing to think about that something that wants to be your friend to be with you beyond the grave even or i guess in the case of this story it wants to be back home go home what are you too good for your home answer me <laughs> it's a theme that resonates with me and in, it seems so fitting for that to be a dog and a dog is I guess at one point, dogs must have been wild animals. I mean, there are still wild dogs out there. Wolves and hyenas and whatnot. Dingoes. <laughs> so there are many wild dogs, and then there's hundreds, it seems. I don't know how many breeds of dog. I think that was one of the questions that I got on the Guru Showdown was uh, some breed of dog. And I was just like, I don't know. And then they said, oh, it was a Kwitsatsputskipadinsky. So there's hundreds. That wasn't really what it was. I was obviously making something cheesy up, but it didn't even sound like a breed of a dog. It wasn't like a Sheltie or a Pug or something like that. It was something that sounded like a Phylum or something like that. But uh, yeah, there's hundreds of breeds of dogs out there that, that people have domesticated. But even then, they're still animals. They still want to go on walks. They love to go out and sniff everything. They want to be in nature. So you can definitely see the ghost of a dog coming back again and again to try and get that to happen. You know, that reminds me of an article that I read, I guess it was about a month ago. And I said, oh, we got to read this article on the air. And you said, we don't read news articles on the air. <laughs> and I said, well, we're going to make an exception. I read this article about a month ago about a soldier in Afghanistan. Uh, uh -huh. His name was Liam Tasker, which okay. is a cool spy <laughs> yeah. name or, or, you know, TV spy name. And he was a, the handler of a bomb-sniffing dog in Afghanistan. And uh, the dog's name was Theo. And apparently this dog had sniffed out 14 bombs, hidden bombs, uh, more so than, than any other dog. And they were so impressed with his accomplishment ability. that they extended the dog's tour of duty. And uh, then his handler, this Lance Corporal Liam Tasker, was killed in a firefight with insurgents. And a couple hours later, Theo died as well of a seizure. And they were both shipped home together. And when I first read that, I, I don't know why it, it moved me and it touched me in much the same way as this story and much the same way as Space Doggity. 
it seems poetic that the dog had such a connection to his master that when the master died, the dog did as well. Like the little old song about the grandfather's clock stopping. Oh, right. When the old man died. And I thought, well, gosh, I'm going to read an article on the air for the first <laughs> time. But uh, Summing it up is okay. That's, that's close enough. That makes me actually think of another famous bit of dog literature, Where the Red Fern Grows. I don't know if everyone reads that in school growing up. If, I hope kids still do these days. It's either fifth or sixth grade that we, we read Where the Red Fern Grows in school. It was at one of those, you know, the teachers reading it to us each day, a little bit at a time as we go through school. And it was one of those that we all got so wrapped up in. I, I think my best friend actually went out and rented the movie so that he could know what was going to happen next. And the funny thing was, to make it work in the movie, they actually had to change some things just to, for it to make sense. Because like there was this one raccoon that they were trying to hunt, and it was like the hardest to catch raccoon ever because it had some kind of trick and they changed the trick in the movie and so my friend's like oh i'll tell you what happens this is how he does it and then we read it and no he didn't do it that way what the heck but it's one of those books that's just so good it's about this boy who wants more than anything to have dogs that he can go hunting with he's he's a backwoods living kind of kid and he just wants to go out and hunt coons and he finally saves up enough money and he buys himself two hunting hound dogs and he has to walk all the way to the, like the next town to pick them up from the post office because he lives so far from everything and he becomes this great hunter and they work together as a team and he gets these two dogs is it one's a female one's a male and they're like brother and sister i guess and he names them big dan and little ann and they uh they go out hunting for raccoons every night all the time, and, and he's bringing home these raccoons, and I guess he sells the, the pelts. It's set in the past where something like that was still worthwhile. And yeah, he, he's, he's earning money for his family and enjoying himself every minute as he does it as well. And his dogs become so good that his parents decide to enter them into this raccoon hunting contest that's going on and they manage to win this raccoon hunting con it's just this great story and and it's all built up and then after they've won this contest they go out hunting like later on that week and and they're attacked by a cougar the one big dan i believe it is jumps in to save his master from the cougar and he and the two of the dogs manage to scare the cougar away but uh the one dog is hurt so badly that uh, in the end, Big Dan passes away and they bury Big Dan. And little Anne, like this dog in the news article, loves the companion so much that she just can't go on. She basically winds up dying of a broken heart. And uh, they bury the two of them right next to each other. And as a kid, too... You don't expect, for some reason, I, I don't know why you don't expect that, because it seems like every bit of childhood literature always ends with the dog dying or somebody, it's always death at the end of every bit of stuff for kids. I guess they're just trying to teach kids about death. It's, it's a hard subject, so fiction can help them through it or something, but I guess you should expect it, but you don't expect it. You expect it to be triumphant and happy, like the end of Babe or something, instead of the end of both of his dogs wind up dead one of dead of a broken heart the other one sacrifices himself for his master and, and it's just a touching story and i remember as a kid almost wanting to cry right there in the middle of the class as they read this story and of course you can't do that because people are eh -eh. uncle rich why are you such a pussy you know they're gonna be pulling crap like that to you in grade school but it's hard not to. It, and I think it's all got to do with, you know, you know the loyalty and the love that dogs have for people and for each other as well. And it's it's hard to uh, to see that kind of a thing. I guess it's a way to learn and grow through fiction is by experiencing those kind of things. But yeah, th this story of the soldier in Afghanistan really makes me think of that. This dog just died because his master died? Really? That's something that actually happened. It wasn't in a story. This was a true occurrence. The dog just died of a seizure. And then the story doesn't go into details. They didn't like do an autopsy on the dog to discover what caused it to die. Did it inhale some kind of nerve gas? Probably not. 
who knows what really caused the death, but it sure seems like it was because it was a loyal dog. It was a dog that loved its master so much that it couldn't go on without it. It makes me think of, a, of another story I once saw where there was these people that they were married and they'd been married for like 50 years, six, 70 years, something like that. They're in a rest home together, this married couple childhood sweethearts they'd stayed together all these years they're in the rest home together and when one of them died like hours later the other one died as well and the connection was so so strong i don't know go (laughs) i've talked for too long it's a sober subject and we're not often a sober show you should check out our belch reel (laughs) I don't know. Is there anything that you want to say about the space opera or the the, the character of Saida Gurch? Hopefully we can catch up with her later in other adventures. Yeah, that's definitely something that we'd like to do. We really liked the story and, and we, we tried to make sure that the folks in the story were doing voices for us, were ones that we were sure would be back for more if we asked them to be back because we're considering uh, the possibility of doing other Side to Gurch Adventures, as uh, Rick mentioned in his author's note. We actually have one that he sent us that I was going to read over and, and see how much I liked it after reading this story. You know, I loved it so much that I, I want to see that if uh, this other story has the same effect on me. I love when we have recurring stories or sequels or right. series right. within our show. And I would think that the listeners like that, too, because you and I liked it so much when they would do Union Dues on Escape Pod. Mm-hmm. Hopefully this goes hand in hand with that. Yeah, I would hope so. She's she's an interesting character. This, what are they called, Gartinos, I think it is, the genetically engineered people. And somehow a side effect of this genetic engineering has made her sensitive to ghosts, made her like a, a ghost whisperer. <laughs> I don't know. She's She's empathetic. She's got a connection to the other side. It's it's kind of like Ernie Pine, but in space, <laughs> in a way. Although even the captain hears the dog bark at, at a point and hears the whine, I think. But she's the one that was able to see what the ghost... She's like the kid on the sixth sense that can talk to the ghost, find out what they want, and take care of them. Whereas uh, the rest can only be scared by the ghosts and run screaming into the other room. I think it's a really interesting idea, and uh, I'm excited to uh, take a look at some of the other stories and give Cy de Gerch, Lieutenant Peters, Captain Brown, and all the others another run on our show. I also really enjoy the sequel effect, as long as they're good. See, that's the key. Movie sequels have a tendency to usually go down in quality a bit each time. I, I think there are some exceptions to that rule. There are some movie sequels that are even uh, dark knight for example you could say was a movie sequel to batman begins which probably was above and beyond its original story it was probably an even better film than the first one was it doesn't happen often unfortunately yet hollywood still keeps on cranking out movie sequels and what's worse is they keep cranking out movie sequels to movies from years ago now i, I see that scream 4 is now in theaters is it one of those things that people were just, oh, we want more Scream. Come on. We're demanding more. I don't think so. Just that Hollywood's got freaking no clue anymore. Like, well, that one was good. Let's make another one. Maybe I'll get our money back. See, I, I like sequels. I don't have a problem like at it. all with sequels. Remakes is what I effing uh, hate. I like sequels, but I, only when I, they're good. I have no problem with there being 20 five James Bond films <laughs> and 11 the Star Trek films bring on the next one and it, it's yeah you're right the quality has to maintain you know it, so bring on the next Matrix you're for saying example, <laughs> fast and for furious. example uh, Fast and the Furious Fast Five comes out this summer and okay that I guess I can agree with you money grubbing soulless Hollywood shitheads <laughs> but Saw 6 Indiana Jones 4 came out everybody hated it you know what, Spielberg? Make Indiana Jones 5. Make a good one. Let's not leave it us on a, a sour note. Yeah, sure, there you go. You, there was a misstep there. Indiana Jones is one of those characters that there should be. Let's catch up with Indy every couple of years. Yeah. Just like the James Bond thing. Just like the Star Trek crew. And Star Trek is amazing because you've had different crews that you could make stories from. Yeah. You know, a movie like Nemesis comes out and Star Trek Nemesis. 
a movie like Batman and Robin comes out or whatever, and it brings the franchise to a halt, I, I guess I understand that the audience souring because of that. But you make a good Bat one. Bat Batman and Robin was followed up by Batman Begins. Star Trek Nemesis was followed up by the J.J. Abrams Star Trek. And all is forgiven. Once a good one comes yeah. out, we see what we loved so much about the other 10 installments in, in your series. And with Indiana Jones, I mean, you can, there were a lot of people, who, there are a lot of people out there who complain about the Temple of Doom, saying the Temple of Doom wasn't as cool as the other. But they made a third one and people came and saw it and they enjoyed it. I like that when there's a book series or it's about characters that you've grown to love. It's something that we said just in last week's episode was that how much better television has become than film. And that's part of the reason why is you catch up with these characters and they grow a little bit and you get to know them in a way that you, that you can't even know James Bond, which has right. to be the longest running franchise that I'm aware of. There's actually a Bollywood franchise that has 79 sequels. Oh, well, I'm sure, but all of that <laughs> is festering, bubbling. Come on, you just don't understand it. Okay. I don't understand how the digestive system works either, but I'm not going to play with shit. <laughs> I um, think we ought to bring back the hate letter of the week. When you've created something that people respond to, and they, they grow attached to the character. They grow attached to the world that you've created. Just keep keep going. I'm, I'm not particularly excited about Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides. Mm -hmm. But I'll go see it if people say that it's good. Right. And if it's good, I'll say bring on number five. And so hopefully we'll catch up with Saida Gurch again in the future and find out a little bit more about her and, and, and the people around her if people respond to it. Yeah, that would be very cool. That could have been good, but it sure wasn't. So, hey, this is the part of our show where I ask Big uh, where the title of our podcast came from. The Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. Oh, wait a minute. Fiction. That, That's just This is that part of the show? I don't... It's oh, not on my script. Oh, let's just wing it for, for the next 35 whoa, seconds. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We all know that I'm not good enough to just wing it. Where's the... Oh, Sorry, I have the old one. My, okay. My page is Here, still yellow. We'll, we'll just read off the same one. Uh, okay. Snuggle up. Gee, Big, I was wondering, where did the name Doonstief come from? Funny story, Rish. It turns out the name Doonstief is named after a famous man in history. His name was Dr. Damon Doonstief. Oh, yes? Yes. He was the man who invented the onion ring. He had a PhD in biochemistry. You see, now this is the part where the script says they can't all be funny, folks. But I'm going to go <laughs> off script and say, so far none have been funny. <laughs> Good night. Uh, this is the, I think this is the part where we all laugh and then it does the freeze frame. Oh. And all the credits appear. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for so listening to the news. Moving on Doomsday. up. Moving on up. So that brings us to the end of our 100th episode. And... If there are people out there that have listened to us since the very beginning, I, I, and maybe there aren't, but thank you. Thank you for accompanying us on this trip. And we're not done. We're not. Goodbye, everybody. We will be back again in just a few days with another episode. And who knows what lies just beyond the horizon. We may be here five years from now still doing this. I, I don't know. Perhaps that's the, uh, the magic of life is you don't know. I mean, some awful thing might be around the corner, but some awesome thing might be there too. And the worst you can do is stop and not go find out what's around that corner. There's a brand new life around the bend. <laughs> well, with that, I, I've, I guess I've been Rich Outfield. Angela, I've been Big Eklovich. Mona, <laughs> Samantha. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening, folks. See you later. And now it's Thinking time for the hate now. letter of the week. Again? It's been a while since we had the last one. I know, and it's been nice, kind of. <laughs> oh, so. All right. Let's get it out of the way. Okay. I'm like, what could they possibly say that nobody said before? No, you know, I think this one might be uh, a little unique. Yeah. Well, let me see it. Oh, okay. Three pages? What the... <laughs> Dude, you're not really going to read that on the air. Dear Big Anklevich and R080T, and announcer man, sorry. I have enjoyed listening to your story readings in the past. 
However, every time I listen to his show, the other co-host, Rich Outfield, has said something either insensitive or offensive. Time and time again, his attempts at humor, his comments, and his opinions are repellent to me. Rich has made countless racist and bigoted comments on the show, sometimes before the story. For example, on episode 71, Rich said, and I quote, A dog is more affectionate than a cat, more loyal, and a dog will hump your leg, which a cat thinks it's too good for. I don't remember saying that. On episode 74, Rich said, That girl who plays in the Harry Potter films is sure hot. Too bad she's over 18 now. On episode 80, Rich said, Notting Hill is nearly a perfect film. I would watch it at the funeral of my father. Episode 86, The thing with women is, besides their obvious physical charm and long hair, lots of them have boobies. Episode 89, I can't wait for America to sink into the sea so that Canada can finally shut up about us. Well, hey, hey, I'm an American. I can say things about America if I want to. On episode 92, I think the English are the most attractive people on the planet if you don't mind the pasty, unearthly-looking skin and brown teeth. I stand by that. Look, I love the English. And that's not being racist. I mean the white ones. Episode 94, I think black people are good athletes because they're tall and thin and often enjoy sports. Sorry. I suggest you remove Rich from the show. It would make everything more palatable, and the show would lose nothing for his absence. If you do not dismiss him forthwith, I will boycott the show and the products that sponsor it. Sincerely, Nicole Chittister Tobler. Keep those cards and letters coming, folks. <sighs> Look, this isn't the only complaint we've got. People really dislike you, man. Tell me about it. But you helped me out with the show when it was new, so I'm going to give you one more chance. Come on, Jew, spit it out. See, uh, that's exactly what I'm talking about. No more racial or sexual or cultural slurs or comments from this point on. Not even about Australians. Not even about Australians. Or the dirty Irish. Especially not the dirty... Uh, the Irish. Or what? Or you're off the show. <laughs> Come on, don't be such a Mexican. <sighs> this is too much. Good night, folks. Thank you for listening to the Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, no deviation... <laughs> Hearing me, hearing me, the drive to your voice command. Richelieu Benjamin Outfield, you have been ordered before this council to answer to charges of offending our few remaining listeners. How do you plead? Get splanched, Ron Weasley. Rish Outfield, I find you guilty. Do you find Rish guilty? Guilty. Rish Outfield. I find you guilty. Rish. You suck. Guilty. Oh, wait, OT, how do you rule? That douchebag is so guilty. Rish Outfield. Mmm, I find you guilty of all charges. Rish Outfield, guilty. I find you guilty. Hi, ho, Grandma the Frog here. I always knew he was guilty. And he has also said some very despicable things about my girlfriend, Miss Piggy. Do you find Rish guilty? I find you guilty, Rish Outfield, and may Allah have mercy on your misbegotten soul. Guilty! Rish Outfield, I find you guilty of all charges. I've never known anyone so guilty as you. How do you find Rish? Rish Outfield, I find you guilty of all charges. Rish. Rish. Bucket. Of course, Rich Alfield is guilty. I find you guilty, guilty. Rich Alfield. You, sir, are guilty. Rich Alfield, I find you guilty of all charges. Rich Girardi. Rich Alfield, this court finds you guilty. Rich Alfield is guilty. Don't know what he's guilty of, but. 
I'm sure he is. How do you find Rish? <sighs> You're guilty. Guilty. Rish Outfield. You're guilty as sin. I hope you burst into flames. Mmm, sounds hot. Rish Outfield. He's guilty. Goat boy thinks you should burn in hell. Renee Chambliss. How do you find Rish? Maybe this will be a little easier if you hear it from me. I think you're guilty too, Rish. No, Renee! Just has such a lovely voice. It made it hurt all the more. I find you guilty, Rish Outfield. May God have mercy on your misbegotten cat-hating soul. Okay, that's no surprise. How do you find Rish? Marsha Latham. Guilty. Of course Rich Outfield is guilty. I only wish he lived in earlier days. He deserves to dangle from the end of a rope. He seems like such a nice guy. How do you find Rish? Rish Outfield, you are so guilty. Mildly offensive guest star, do you also vote guilty? Hell yes, Big Anklevich! Clay Duggar. Rish Outfield, I find you guilty of all charges. Why am I not surprised? Wait, what about... What about Samuel L. Jackson? You haven't asked him. All right. Samuel L. Jackson. Is Rish guilty? Yes, they deserve to die, and I hope they burn in hell! Wait, is, are we deciding my life here? <laughs> in no uncertain terms. Hanging's too good for him. Burning's too good for him. He should be torn into little bitsy pieces and buried alive. I find Rish Outfield guilty. Rish Outfield. I've never known anyone so guilty as you. Guilty. Rish Outfield. Guilty. 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 You're guilty and that's all there is to it. Guilty. 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 What say you think I love it? I, uh... How do you rule? I... Do you find Rish guilty? Well... I guess I have to find him guilty too. You bastard! None of that talk now. That leaves only you. The voting must be unanimous, announcer man. Okay. Only you can condemn me if you so choose, and only you will be held responsible by me. You have been known to disagree with the others before? Join me, and we'll run the podcast ourselves. Rish, an announcer man. It'll be glorious. Your authority will be universal, second only to my own. Do you find Rish guilty? I find you guilty, Rish Outfield. Way guilty. <laughs> Rish Outfield, you have been found guilty of all charges. It is the judgment of this council that you be stripped of your rights as host of the Doomsteep Audio Fiction Magazine with nothing further to do with the show or its making. It's about bloody time! Announcer man, you will bow down before me and one day, announcer children! Goodbye, Rish. No! Well, that didn't suck. At the Doonstief, we pay our authors as well as our own bills for the website maintenance and the like, so if you're ever in a generous mood, or even if you're not, we'd love it if you donate. Just press the button on the website to donate $5 a month, a quarter, or choose your own one-time donation amount. Thanks for spending time with us. The Doonstief is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, meaning share it with everyone, but don't sell it or change it. Take two. Rich Outfield, this court finds you guilty of crimes against humanity, and as humanity. such... Humanity. What? Humanity. What did I say? You said humanity. What the hell does that mean? I have no idea, but now I'm hungry for orange beef. Now that you mention it, I am a bit peckish. The Golden Panda Palace, then? Well, what about this Doonstief thing? Blah, 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 you guys are the greatest. Congratulations on your whatever, oh, my frothing loins. Yay, happy? Works for me. She took notice of it the second time in a spare moment after successfully tilting her donuts. Sure like to tilt her donuts. <laughs>
she looked up at Captain Brown in the command position. His eyes were on his she data screen. She looked up at Captain Brown in the missionary position. Oh. None of that. And she'd have to be Sparky when Utopia Plane hit the battlefields of the Procyon system. And she'd... Sparky. I wonder if that's a subtle nod to the whole dog theme. <laughs> that is really subtle. <laughs> Lieutenant Degarch, report maneuvering status, please. Degarch tongued her lip. Ew. <laughs> it is one of those kind of stories. I love it. I wasn't off when I said missionary position. <laughs> Lieutenant Peters. I'm not going to say left, am I? Huh? Remember, have we had to change lieutenant to lieutenant? Back oh, then? no, no, no. That was... <clears throat> this he is was, in the future. Yeah, he was saying that's the way they used to say it in the 40s. They don't even say it that way now, so... Okay. Christ. Christ, not Christy. Christ. Should we look it up, just in case? I don't know if that's a real thing or what. Utopia is a real word. A utopia plane, but... Uh. Is not a real word. On Degurch's weapons... On Degurch's weapons screen... I'm just going to change it to Smith. On Smith's weapons screen. Close the range, said Brown. <laughs> said Brown. He compared them with Dr. Norsk's. <laughs> Dr. Norsk was at his battle station in the surgery, taking inventory for the nth time with his two assistant paramedics. It's hard not to. It's, it's friggin' italicized. How would you say? Just it's mm -hmm. the nth. Oh, the nth time, as in, as if you know, to the nth power, the nth degree. I'm not cracking up, Doctor Norris. She said, "Return to duty." No, I don't want to say it that. Return to duty. How do I put it? How would you say that? It's got to be like a. Okay, return to duty. Return to duty. Return to duty. I like duty. It's the duty of every American. It's going to require massive duty. Sometimes duty is hard. Sometimes duty is painful. Sometimes duty <laughs> hurts coming out of your anus. I like duty. Duty, 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 duty. Permission to relieve you, Mr. Peters. Permission to relieve your Peter. Mr. Peter. Chewbacca. Full speed, medium cluster, fire! I like the word cluster. Soundless seconds later... Because it's always said with the F word nearby. It is. Fire, that is. Okay. <clears throat> stand by starboard lasers. Starboard. Stand by larboard lasers. It was a somber trio. Cy, Captain Brown, and Dr. Norsk who gathered around the hole dug deep into the soil of the Wassy Greenland. <laughs> that was so, it's so awesome. No, it isn't. That was one of the greatest little switcheroos I think I've ever heard. You will pay. <laughs> Wassy Greenland. Stop it. We need to it, 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 welcome everybody to the show with that. Wassy Greenland, everybody. Stop. I'm Big Anglovich. It was a somber trio. Sai, Captain Brown, and Dr. Norsk, who gathered around the hole dug deep into the soil of the windy grassland. You are listening to Daffum. Daff you, Mother Daffer. And, you know, I have been accused of ripping off Drabblecast, and because their 200th episode was so late, I figured, well, I had to do the same. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it... I wasn't farting. It was just me moving my chair. It was the chair. I, I've heard that before a hundred times at least from that same chair. Sincerely, Nicole Chittister Tobler. Why do you laugh? You're Chittister. It's an ugly name, okay? More uh, 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 uh. Stay. Bark, bark, wagtail. Good boy. Good boy.